Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today in studio is our road test editor, Reese Counts, and our associate editor, Joel Stocksdale. Welcome, guys. How's it going? It's going well. It's Friday morning. It's murky. It's kind of misty here in Metro Detroit. I think we're all a little tired, but uh, we have coffees loaded and we're going to get through this. We're going to have a good time. We've all been driving uh, a wide variety of cars, a lot to talk about here, and then some news on the Chevy Camaro. So let's do this. All right. So in the news segment, we're going to talk about the Camaro refresh. Then we'll get through all of the uh, a wide variety of cars that's been in the Autoblog garage. This includes the Lexus UX, the Lexus GSF, the Volvo V90, which I literally was driving about an hour ago, and the Mercedes GLS, which Reese has spent some time in. Uh, then we'll get on to the features segment where we talk about how many AMGs is too many. We actually meant to get to this last week. Uh, we ran out of time, uh, but we'll get to it this week. Uh, and finally, we will spend your money with a very cool uh, question. Uh, we'll tease this out here and say it could involve a Nissan Pulsar. All right, so let's jump right in. Camaro has uh, done a bit of a refresh. Let's put it that way. I'm kind of struggling with how to characterize it. They're uh, saying that they just took uh, some themes from the concept from SEMA and put it on the road. But what I think we all know is they had to rush in a refresh here because people hated the last one. Uh, it's a fairly simple refresh. They just kind of uh, buttoned down that gaping maw, which was in the... Uh, the most recent car, it made it look more conventional, essentially more like, you know, the last few Camaros. So what do you guys think? Well, I'm really glad that they did it because I hated the new front end for the SS. It, I Every time I would see one, I felt like it, it looked like it had been in some kind of accident. It looked like somebody had punched a giant hole through the front bumper and it drove me crazy. And it, and it was really frustrating because the four-cylinder and V6 versions actually had a decent refresh. Um, it took me a little bit to get used to them, but like now that I am, I think it looks pretty nice. Uh, so I'm glad that they did do this update. What is funny, if you look closely, what appears to be the case is that they took the current ugly bumper, they painted the center bar, and then they moved the badge up into the top half of it. So yep. I think moving the badge is like the biggest thing. It mm -hmm. seems little, but like it brings like the weight like of the nose down. It like it kind of lifts like the grill itself or like lowers the bumper and lifts like the grill, uh, at least visually, not like in reality. Um, and it helps. I mean, so I've not been a big fan of the like sixth gen Camaro design since it came out in 2015. Um just before the refresh, I finally drove like a, a one LE and I'm like, okay, I'm starting to warm up to this. And they, then they came out with the uh, like 2019 design. I'm like, oh, this is heinous. I mean, really, really bad. Um, I didn't care for the like V6 and like non SS ones, but the SS is really, really bad. Um, and to change it after a single model year, uh, credit where credit's due Chevy listened to their customers. Like people obviously did not like it. Um, Sales have slumped. I mean, it. we saw earlier that, like, uh, the Challenger has overtaken the uh, Camaro in sales. Like, they had to do something. People obviously do not like this. So um, I'm still not the biggest fan, but it does look better. Um, yeah, I'm inclined to agree. I think it would be nice if they continued to offer this, like, sort of, you know, very prominent kind of blackout grill as an option. Because I think there's some people that would like it. Um because it, it does have that, I think that almost has like the concept car feel. It's a little riskier. It's a little more, you know, avant-garde. Uh, I think the changes that they've made, it looks like a Camaro, straight out of central casting. And I think that's fine. Um, to your point, Reese, moving the bow tie up makes a huge difference. At first, I didn't even notice it. And then like... When you look a little closer, you're like, oh, yeah. It's just it, like, recenters the car. Yeah. And it, it gives it that Camaro look. Whereas, I mean, I almost wonder if they had done that with the other model, it might have worked out better. I don't know. I mean, it looks like it's pretty narrow there anyway. But it can't mess with logos. You know, it's that's a thing. You just you start to move stuff around. People get mad. Um but I may be the only one. And I think, Joel, you and I talked about this on the podcast maybe last fall because I think there were reports of this coming out. Uh, we saw maybe some spy shots or something. 
And I was like, I kind of like it. I actually think this is okay. I think it's sort of like where the market's going with, you know, blackout wheels, blackout grills, like less chrome, less, you know, body colored pieces. I, I, obviously, I'm in the minority here. Obviously, I'm wrong. But um, I like it. I, I think the outgoing grill was actually pretty cool looking. I think maybe it would have been okay if they had completely redesigned the rest of the car too. Because I think part of the problem was that like, it just had this really blunt, flat front on a car that was clearly designed to be kind of pointy and wedgy. And so I think maybe that uh, giant blackout front end could have worked if everything else was supporting it, but I don't feel like that was the case. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I, it's, it is better. I still don't love it. Um, but let me be clear. The Camaro drives like really, really great. Um, it's probably, it's got better steering than the Mustang and for sure the Challenger. Um, really great engines, great suspension. I mean, it, it's the chassis and powertrain are excellent. Um, I just think it's ugly. Um, but I am looking through uh, the photos on the uh, story right now, and I do want to briefly touch on the new LT1. Mm -hmm. That I'm excited about that. Maybe yeah. more, far more than the redesign, actually. And looking at the photos, I think I prefer the front end of that better than the SS. Yeah, I do um, too. Because well, because that's the V6 and four cylinder yeah. nose, and I think that looks a lot better than even the redesigned SS nose. Hundred um, percent. And like. You get the V8 and like kind of this is I mean you're not going to get all that like suspension handling stuff from the SS. So what? I like big comfortable cruisers with big engines. Um it kind of reminds me of the old like Ford Mustang Fox body, the uh 5 liter LX where like it wasn't the Mustang GT, but you got like the big engine and like just kind of a straight line car. I mean, I think this is going to be appealing to a lot of people. Um cuz not everybody tracks their car. Some people just want the big V8 and that's great i think it looks good um like i said before the powertrains on these gm cars are fantastic um and i think joel mentioned it in slack yesterday it drops the price below the ford mustang gt which mm -hmm. is huge that's compelling yeah and the other thing is i think really the only change is that it doesn't have uh staggered wheels with summer tires anymore it goes to like all seasons slightly narrower than the ss otherwise i think it's pretty much everything from the SS, but it's a lot cheaper and it's got a better looking front end. I, this seems like the one to buy unless like you want an SS1 LE. I'm yeah. incl inclined to agree with both you guys there. This is the car. It's like a $35,000 V8 with a grill that looks awesome. It looks like a transformer. Yeah. I'd like to, Joel just said, if you, unless you want the like one LE, I'd rather buy this and a set of tires of my own dime. Like, mm -hmm. truthfully, I don't want the one LE. I've driven that car for a few years now. I feel like that is, it's awesome on a track. And I feel like they've done some things to button it down a little bit to make it a little more livable. But when that thing first came out, it was like, there was like one speaker in it, like the back seat or something was an option. Like, that's a little too far for me. That's like a little too rare of a stake as far as I'm concerned. I just... I don't know if I could get the current Camaro over Mustang. Um, I the Camaro drives a little better, but like living with it like day to day, the Mustang's so much better. It's just it's easier to see out of. It's got a better interior. It's got a usable like trunk. Um, yeah, it's just a better car. Like Joel and I had drove a br Bullet briefly in Los Angeles. Like that thing's rad, and like even the regular GT is so good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I like the Camaro, but it's still, even with this redesign, it's not not my thing. I really like how the Camaro looks generally. I think since it came back in this latest generation uh, about 10 years ago now, I have generally liked its looks. I think they've done a good job of refining it, um, making it a little more defined, a little more precise. Uh, but I agree with you. The Mustang just overall... And I like how the Mustang looks better too. Overall, I like how it looks better. I like how it drives better. I would disagree a little bit like on daily driving that the Mustang's that much better. That seems to be sort of this like narrative that it is. I don't know. I feel like I've had some pretty raw experiences in the Mustang. Just 
around town. I remember I did some extended time in one uh, north of LA, and I remember thinking, man, you know, I, like I literally almost spun out when I was making a hard left turn. I was like, this thing's a little rougher than people sort of like give it credit for in a good way. Yeah. Um, but overall, I would definitely give the Mustang a little bit of, uh, you know, an edge too. So since we've turned this into Mustang versus Camaro, Joel? So I would go with Camaro. Um, I, I love this generation of Camaro, uh, despite all its flaws. Um, I totally agree with you guys. I think the Mustang is the better all around package. It has better visibility. I think it looks better. It does have a more usable trunk. Um, and it's got a much nicer interior, uh, than the Camaro, but I just love the way the Camaro drives so much. I think it, it feels lighter and more nimble and, I feel like the steering is more precise and I I just I really 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 love the way it drives and I can forgive the other little things like worse visibility and kind of a plastic interior for having a car that just makes me feel so good whenever I drive it. And that's I also have that same feeling. And for me it's very close to like for some people it's slam dunk Mustang or Camaro for some people. Um, but for me, it's very close. And I was actually literally thinking about this as I went to refill my coffee mug. Just your brain goes to this place where it's like, you're thinking about Camaro and then it's like Camaro versus Mustang. And I'm like, nah, I still would take the Mustang over the Camaro. So I think the actual answer is if you, at least if you're going to like spend more than 40,000 on like an SS one LE is to find a Corvette. I mean, there's so many good deals on Corvettes right now. You can have them for like 45. That's true, but I don't think everybody's a, Camar- a Corvette person. You know, like that yeah. like takes it up a step higher. And like you may really not want to live with a Corvette, you know. It's got a better trunk than both. That's I, true. Like, yeah, but I mean, if you just consider the back seat as trunk, which it basically is, because let's face it, unless you're maybe putting like a baby seat back there or like a really tiny child or maybe your dog, like you're not, you're not putting a actual human in the back of a Mustang or a Camaro. I've sat in the back of a Mustang before. <laughs> it was miserable. It was oh, so bad. I spent about 30 <laughs> minutes in the back of a GT350 one time. I think during Dream Cruise. And, like, it was hot and, like, cramped. <laughs> oh. And my head was just kind of cocked uh-huh. uh, against the glass. And I had to, I think, apologize to Ford for a face smear on the <laughs> rear window. But um, I do want to briefly, like, mention the uh, gallery that we've got on the site with the... Uh, so-called emergency facelifts. Um, we we're talking about this, like w- the last time somebody like a company, like realized like, Oh, we screwed up like this quickly, I think was the 2012 to 2013 civic. Um, yeah. Like the 2012 civic was like a single model year design. And then they refresh it because everybody was like, this is not very good. Um, and like personally, I think it was a little hyperbolic. Like I think the 2012 civic was still pretty good. Um, but it was like missing a few things and the t- refresh got better. But, uh, what are some of the other cars on this list? I think too, with the civic, that car was redesigned and, you know, product cycles are a little bit obviously out in front of when cars go on sale. So that car was redesigned like Oh seven, Oh eight, Oh nine in there when the economy was just blowing up globally across the world. So by the time they rolled it out, Oh wait, the economy is a little bit better the car was just, it was underwhelming. And people were like, well, what's going on here? You know, you you didn't make the car better. It was sort of redesigned for this period of austerity and people didn't want that by 2012. So that's, I mean, that's where it kind of fell short. Ironically, Honda was pretty defensive about it. They always pointed out that it sold well, that their customers liked it, but us, the journalists were wrong. I don't think you win many arguments by telling the media that they're wrong, but Um, they had a point that it sold okay, but that car is just, it was designed for the wrong time. You know, if the economy had continued to be bad, people would have wanted like a cheerful and cheap car. Uh, but by the time that thing made it out, it's like, oh, okay. Uh, Well, look at some of these other things you could get for this money. What are you guys doing here? And obviously when they redesigned it a year later, they admitted they were wrong. Uh, And I remember that one of the big things that really got Honda concerned was that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, 
But Consumer Reports, I believe, dropped the recommended rating for the Civic because of that redesign, because it was just kind of, it was kind of average or not even that compared with the out with compared with the previous generation. And I mean, when like all of the media is saying it's not very good, even like some of the hardest to please people in the world over a current over a consumer reports, like that's, that's a problem. <laughs> Another one on here that I think is, was pretty controversial was the, uh, early aughts, uh, BMW seven series. The, uh, 2002 had the bangle, butt, which a lot of us will remember. And then BMW kind of doubled down on that, but then they revised it for 06, uh, which, you know, I wasn't as offended by that as some people were, but, um, you know, I mean, to me, this was just like early to mid 2000s styling. Uh, but some people really, really had some strong feelings on that. I like in general, don't think the, uh, 2002, that, that generation seven series has aged very well. Um, I like the, uh, what E93 series, like the real Bengal era cars, the E93 series, and then the E60 M5, I believe is the right chassis code. Anyway, like yeah, that, think so. that mid night, that sorry, that mid 2000s, like uh, BMW design. I think the other ones, the smaller cars have aged well. I just don't think this one looked very good. I didn't very much care for it very much when it came out, um, especially because of the Bengal butt. I hate to like. I don't want to sound like I'm uh, just uh, blindly agreeing with everybody else, but it's not very good. Um, the refresh did help, but I don't know. I, I I think the front end looks a little dopey too, even though we don't have any photos in the gallery. But yeah. truthfully, I think I like the O2 better than the O6 because I don't think they're changes. They kept the bangle, but essentially it did some stuff to the front that cleaned it up a little bit, but. I don't know. I, in some ways, I feel like the O2 at least sort of carried over some of BMW's like ethos from the 90s when they were like, you know, killing it on a lot of different fronts. Whereas the O6, it was just like, I don't know. That car felt a little vanilla to me. Any of these other cars stand out to you guys? I do want to mention the Cherokee. Um, so I, I think we touched about this like maybe last week or the week before on the podcast when we actually had a Cherokee in the office. I like the Cherokee. I like the way it drives. I, uh, I like it's like Jeep, uh, ish nature and it's kind of an interesting thing in the class. Uh, the refreshed headlights for 19, um, make it a little more drab. Like it's a lot less distinct. Um, and I know not everybody like love the, like kind of a split design and the low set headlights in the 2014 model, but, now the other one just looks like every other Jeep, and I think they kind of lost something. Um, if it's selling well, then it doesn't matter. Like Customers like it, and it's a little less controversial, but it's also a little less distinct. I mm. think, too, with that one, the controversy was when the first Cherokee came out, recent Cherokee came out, is it didn't look like the older ones. Right. And people were like, objectively, like in a vacuum, I like that design. I really did. But people were like, well, where is, you know, the 90s Cherokee? What are you guys doing to our Cherokee? And then this thing comes out and they're like, whoa. But I think it actually found its audience pretty quickly. That segment was red hot. It is red hot. So I think that helped. And I like that one. I agree with, uh, I think, both you guys that the, like the 19, it's a subtle look. It looks, I mean, it starts to kind of look more like the compass. It's, I think it loses its fastball a little bit. But it's still, again, it's attractive. But after I was at first sort of like, whoa, what did they do to the Cherokee? Really grew to like it. And then it's like, I feel like they watered down the front end a little bit. And let me be clear. I do like the refreshed back end a lot. Um, they moved the license plate, changed the lights. Uh, and the, the refresh, I wish they just kept the old front end with the new rear end. Um, I think it would have given it like a really interesting character, but... Yeah, it's, that's the only other one that really stands out to me. I think all the other ones were like for, uh, like improved the design a lot. Uh, the looking through here, the Tribeca, the what we've got the uh, the Sebring, which I don't think looked good in either iteration, <laughs> to be honest. But once yeah. it became the two hundred and it had that M M&M and M Super Bowl commercial, even though it God. was like basically the same car, 
I mean, it changed everything, right? Yeah. Joel, did you want to say something? Um, well, I was just going to add to the Cherokee thing that I, I definitely agree that it's more drab at the front, but I think the back end has improved enough that I would probably take the later version, uh, especially moving up that license plate. Like I felt like the old one, it looked like a minivan from the back end. It just like looked like kind the of, moving the bow tie on the Camaro. I think it really like changed the visual weight of where mm-hmm. like it like dropped it and made it feel a little less like top heavy. Um, yeah, because that was that was a big slab yeah. of metal in the back it, that wasn't broken up at all, and it, so it just looked heavy and kind of flabby. Yeah, it gave it like it looks more like an SUV, kind of a little rough, like mm-hmm. a little bulked up, which is kind of what I want to see. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, how about yeah. we talk about some of the cars we've been driving? Yeah, you know, just uh, in the vacuum design. Uh, we will lead things off with uh, a very interesting little car hatchback crossover thing that was in the fleet this week. Uh, Joel, you and I both drove it. We both spent a decent amount of time in it. The Lexus UX. How was your user experience in the Lexus UX? <laughs> I see what you did there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually really like this little thing, like a lot. And I was kind of surprised. It's, it's a really great, just all around little car. It's, it's amazingly quiet, which is which I was very impressed by and is I think an important thing if you're buying a luxury car of some sort. Um, it's got a really, it's got a really comfortable ride. It's actually quite soft and forgiving, but it also, I found can be kind of fun if you push it. Like it's got fairly precise if like really kind of numb and light steering and like it feels really planted in corners. There's some body roll, but like I could actually have some fun with it. I I really like it. I um I'll admit I wasn't super pumped to drive it. So I think it when you go into a car with like fairly like middling expectations and you have a good time, like just your experience is, you know, much more positive. And I would echo your comments. I I was a little all over the place with the car, but overall I liked it. Like I like the front end, which I think is like really intense for a small car. It's got that like Lexus, like spindle grill kind of snarling at you. And then it's got these like creases on the side and you're like, wow. Okay. And then those taillights in the back. I love those taillights, how they kind of like stick out and make like a little fin. And it's like, I agree. Connected all the way across. (laughs) It's, it's very intense. And I could easily see how somebody would be looking for something in this segment. Take one look at this and be like, whew. No, thank you. And keep on walking because it's very intense. But I'll give Lexus credit. They're really going for it. Like, they're not saying we're going to make some, you know, vanilla, mid-sized, milk toast, you know, small crossover. They're, like, going for it with their design. And that's reflected from one of the smaller vehicles in their lineup all the way up to the bigger SUVs. So, you know, like it or hate it, it is what it is. Um, But it was really quiet. I agree with you. It was... Like it was serene in there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was driving uh, my son around and like his car seat was kind of like forward and it's not very big interior. And my seat was back a little bit. And like, it just, it was almost like we were like in the same area. It was very chill. You could see out of it pretty well. Steering's okay. I was getting about 36 miles per gallon on the onboard uh, computer, which You know, it's a little below the ratings, but I mean, you know, hybrid ratings are kind of, you know, kind of sketchy anyway. This one's 39 combined, 41 city, 38 highway. Uh, The total system horsepower is 181. So you've got the hybrid, you know, gizmos, and then it's a two liter uh, four cylinder engine. So that's a pretty modest figure, but it was peppy at times. Like you want to take off, you get that little bit of electric assist. Um, yeah, I liked it. I mean, and like I said, I didn't like all of it because parts of the design, I would say I was like struck by, but not sure if I liked them, but the overall experience was very good. Yeah. And I think like something that I enjoyed with driving it, I think, I think I would have to go with the hybrid and not the naturally aspirated one just because you do get that extra horsepower and it is noticeable, especially like at low end because you're getting that electric torque. Um, But also I I actually like the all wheel drive on it. So how it does it is that it's got an electric motor in the back to power the rear wheels. And it, 
I actually I discovered that you can switch off the traction control like completely, and then you can like really feel the back wheels participating and like can even get them a little bit loose. You are the only person who will ever <laughs> do that in the Lexus UX. Hybrid. Oh, I'm I'm sure, but more people should because it was actually kind of fun. I was like, you know, I could almost I could almost see taking this to like an autocross or something. Um, <laughs> also, I think I would have to go with the F Sport, which is which is the version that we had because. Even this felt really soft. I can't imagine what the regular one is like. The, like the regular one must just feel like it's on marshmallows. <laughs> I feel like your average buyer would probably not even be looking for F Sport on this, but I agree with you. The F Sport really dialed this thing up to the point where I was like, this is pretty fun. You know, some of the like the F Sport design elements really punched it up too. That wasn't something I noticed at first until I like, I was looking at it in my driveway and I'm like, is the UX an F Sport? Whoa. I didn't even know they offered that on the mm -hmm. UX. So, I mean, what we actually drove was the UX 250H F Sport 2019 in ultrasonic blue mica officially. This one stickered for $40,910. Uh, started at about $36,000. So, uh, you know, if you need a vehicle this size and you want to go with a hybrid, it's, it's something to look at because it's there's a lot going on. It's interesting. I didn't like the... Uh, infotainment me and the like i don't know the lexus systems i'm just not feeling them i yeah. did like the weird i don't know if i'd say like but i was intrigued by the weird thing they've done in the center console it's almost like an old radio like you can like mm -hmm. scroll with your thumb and your fingers to change the volume i kind of liked it but i also was like did anybody ask for this this is weird yeah, that was the one other thing I wanted to mention. The, the, there are some things that I don't like about it, and it's primarily the infotainment system. I think it's awful. <laughs> um, I They've gone to like a little touchpad, but it's still kind of the interface that you used with the mouse. And it's much better with the mouse because you can be more precise about where you're uh, clicking. And... Like, the mouse holds your position with this touchpad. Like, if you take your finger off of it and you put it back on, you could be pressing almost anywhere that on the screen. That garbage. Yeah. And I, like, I appreciate that they try to put in, like, some haptic feedback so that you can kind of feel that you've gone to other spots. But it just, it doesn't work well at all. It's terrible. Um, as for those radio controls that you mentioned, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I don't, I don't hate them. I don't know if I like them, but they're definitely interesting. I mean, like, clearly the idea is that you can just, like, rest your hand there, like, all the time. And if you feel like you need to adjust the volume, you can just, like, wiggle a finger here or there so that you don't have to do much. But it there's at least a small learning curve because it's not immediately obvious where those buttons are. <laughs> right. It's a... Uh... You know, I would say this about the UX. There's a lot going on, and in some ways, it's a little bit of an uneven experience, but overall, I liked it. Mm -hmm. so, so why don't we move on to another Lexus? This was definitely Lexus week here at Autoblog. We had a bit of a hot rod muscle car, um, the Dodge Charger, I don't know, of the Lexus fleet. That's probably blasphemy. This was the GSF, had the Wampin 5-liter V8. Uh, it looked pretty good. It had this crazy matte gray paint that Reese told everybody, don't wash your car, which doesn't matter because it's literally been raining for the last eight days here in Michigan. Uh, but this was, this was an experience. It sounded kind of like an old school muscle car. It's big. It has presence. Um, Reese, what did you think? So hot take, uh, I might buy this over an M5. Uh, I, that's a hot take. But it's, it's one I agree with. <laughs> this is the thing. <laughs> good. All right. We can get into this yeah. without me feeling attacked. Um, <laughs> so I would not. All right. Let's be clear. I This was the uh, 10th anniversary edition to celebrate 10 years of Lexus's F division, uh, which is like you guys were mentioning with the F sport. It's like their performance sport division equivalent to AMG and uh, M. So I would not buy this. Like the interior is great. It's kind of a uh, mix of blue and black with some uh, white accents, and I think it looks awesome. It reminds me a lot of my own uh, uh, the blue and black interior on my uh, C43 AMG. 
uh, but the paint, man, like I'd never gotten a phone call from a manufacturer beforehand saying, Hey, there's special instructions on this paint. This is like convinced me. I would never buy like matte paint. If I wanted the look, I'd just do like a wrap and like I'd treat it how I wanted it. Um, that said, the rest of the things, most, most of the rest of the things. Great. Um, the five liter engine, uh, is awesome. Naturally aspirated, t- uh, good amount of power, not like explosive, but like just right for the road. I mean, I felt like I could utilize all of it without like really feeling taxed or like uncontrolled. Like it, cars are getting so fast and so powerful these days that like you can't use it on the road. Like that's why we all love like slow car fast, like Miata and GTI and all these like sub 300 horsepower cars is because you can utilize them. Well, the GSF is kind of big and heavy, so you offset the extra power with a little weight. This thing is great. Uh, the transmission, it's good. All the power goes to the rear. You put it in sport mode, you turn traction control off, and this thing will oversteer. And like, But it's controlled. Um, I really like the steering. It's quick. It's light. Um, but I think the feedback's pretty good. Uh, I think it would be a lot better with a different set of tires. But I think these were all seasons or maybe still winters. I mean, it's still a little cool in michigan for uh to run summer tires all year but uh yeah this thing's good i really like i i don't know i was not a fan of the original isf and some of the lexus like f division cars and like like the rcf like i just they were good but they felt like a generation behind like the germans um and this i guess kind of does too but i don't mind it because it's so like much fun like day to day uh on a track i'm sure the amgs or the m5 is going like the 63 is going to be a faster car it's they've just got way more power all-wheel drive now they can put the power down um but i don't think there's entertaining i mean i i i i hate to keep harping on about this engine but like when everybody's going to like turbocharging like having a big naturally aspirated v8 is really really fun um I like this thing like a whole lot to the point where like (coughs) I wouldn't mind owning one in a few years if they drop on the used market. Like this is, I think a really excellent daily driver. It's comfortable. It's quiet. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a nice balance for a sports sedan. I, it's got all the power you could want on the street. Um, it's got a big usable trunk and relatively cush suspension. And this is, this reminds me of like BMWs of old where they were just balanced everywhere. And like, you didn't have to like, even in comfort mode, the GSF is like plenty sporty. Um, yeah, Joel, you said you like it too. Yeah, I love it. And like, I, one of the things that really gets me about it is besides, I mean, the engine is fantastic and it's, it's so eager to rev is one of the other things that's fun about it. Like it, it just swings right up to red line, no hesitation. But what really gets me is the handling. It's it, despite being a big sedan, it's really, really nimble and it feels light. And I especially like the torque vectoring differential in it. Like it feel like when you yeah. set it into track mode, it feels like it like bends around corners. Like it just it turns so tight and so confidently, and it. It's always telling you what's going on. It's really easy to kind of match it and predict it. Like if it starts getting a little bit loose, like it's telling you that. It's not, nothing happens suddenly or like dangerously. It's a very predictable, easy to drive car. And on the flip side, it's super comfortable and quiet and easy to use as a daily basis. My parents came up this week and I took them around in it and like just driving gently is super smooth like like buttery shifts and like really comfortable on the road it was you would have no idea it was like a 470 horsepower super sedan it's it's awesome and i love the blue and white interior i i hate that you can only get it with the matte gray paint because that paint would be a pain to deal with that's a great point <laughs> i really like that interior it seems kind of ridiculous that you can only get it with the matte gray paint that being said Maybe this is like a one-off, celebrate, you know, 10 years of the F division, and then, okay, you could get this 
you know, custom blue interior on some other models because it was awesome. I was sitting in there thinking, when's the last time I saw a blue interior I really like? And it was cool. There's a lot going on in there. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, the takeaways were pretty simple. That the V8 sounds awesome. It's And it gives you, it's fun. I mean, it's a really, you know, gets the pulse going. It's like an old school V8. That's great. I like how the car looks. Uh, interior is pretty refined and quiet too. Uh, but I'll be the descent here. I would definitely not take this over an M5. Now, an M5 costs you about $102,000, but it will get you up to 617 horsepower. So it's kind of an apples to bananas comparison a little bit. Um, I just, I like how the BMW M5 drives. Uh, it's overall package, the overall feel you get when you're driving that car. And I, I still feel like, you know, an M5 has more of a brand halo, more of a, you know, just that, sporting feel and image than frankly the lexus f division ever will have if you could still get a manual transmission in the m5 i might change my tune but now that they're both autos i think i could live with the less less power i mean it's as joel said this is just like it's really comfortable uh when you want it to be and really sharp like when you want it to be um yeah Yeah. and nobody makes cars like this naturally aspirated uh, rear drive, like, like not like just right amount of power for like road. Everybody's going to all wheel drive and turbocharging and like, yeah, it's just really kind of nice to like kind of step back into something a little, a uh, little more analog. Yeah. My, my thing is like, I would absolutely take this over an M5, but I'm also not actually a big fan of the M5. When I had it a while back, I felt a little bit bored on like public roads with it. It's stupid, stupid fast, but it felt kind of like a blunt instrument a little bit. Like, like you hit the gas and it just rips ahead. And I, but I'd never felt like there was really kind of a good in between. And it also, it's so effective at applying its power and its speed that I don't know like the Lexus is just kind of loose enough and silly enough that like I can I can have fun with it around town the BMW I feel like I would need to have it on a track to actually make use of what it can do and that's very fair and what else I think too about what Lexus is doing is not only do they make these cars like very drivable but I bet this thing would be really good on a track too I think it's you could feel its chops, even though I, you know, drove it around the suburbs and didn't do much to, you know, really unleash all of that 467 horsepower. But I really like what Lexus is doing with its like sporting division here. I think they've made like just the F unit kind of like this old school muscle car, like Haven. And I think that's great. I think the way they approach it, at least with some of their vehicles, is it's it's got that like, you know, boulevard race strip kind of feel, you know? And I think it's almost like Lexus never quite got the memo that other people are going to turbos and hybridization and they do some of that stuff too. But it just, it sort of feels like they're like their creed, if you will, is still to almost be like this hot rod division. And I do like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see what they're going to come out with next because the GS is kind of at the end of its life. Um, the same goes for the RC. I'm really hoping we see an LCF because I really like the LC and, uh, I'd like it to like the LC is a really good GT and I'd like to see a version where they kind of sharpen everything up and make it a better sports car. Um, that said, it'll probably go turbos and I'll be a little disappointed, but I don't know. I, I really like what Lexus is doing right now. And I, I'm so surprised. Like I'm saying that because uh, I've really come around on the design. I've really come around on the like performance. Um, yeah, I just really dig the GSF. I really, really, really dig this car. Yeah, and what you said about like with turbos, I mean, it seems like that's got to be an inevitability because like just this engine alone is already pretty old because this is pretty much yeah. what was in that original ISF from over ten years ago now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not changed all that much, but probably a little bit more power, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Toyota itself, I mean, and Lexus, like, what the, LC, 
the LS is getting that or has that twin turbo V6. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a high output version of that made its way into the F cars sometime soon, but uh, I'm hoping they stick with V8s even mm-hmm. if it get, gets forced induction because this thing sounds good. Yeah. I mean, like more than anything, this thing sounds really good. It's ridiculous in some ways, like because yeah. it's almost like I wouldn't say unexpected, but you know, cars don't sound this way that much anymore. So that's, I was really excited when I got in and it was kind of cold and the engine fired up and I'm like, okay, well, great. all right, here we go. You equated it to like the Dodge Charger. And I think that's kind of an apt comparison. Like, um, it's got a big naturally aspirated V8 that sounds kind of rad. It's this big, comfortable cruiser. I like the Charger a lot. And for a lot of the same reasons, I like the GSF, um, GSF drives better, but it's so kind of the same, like, mantra. It's uh, a different I'm, vibe than you get from, like, Audi or Acura yeah, or some of yeah, those, and it, it's, those brands. It's definitely distinct. Well, because I was thinking to myself when I was driving my parents around, I was like, this is really nice. There's no way I can afford one. Will it be, like, the next closest thing? Maybe a 300C with the 5.7? That could be kind of close-ish. Yeah. Sort of. I mean, for the money. Like, because, yeah. <laughs> well, because... The one that we had. $93,000. Yeah. So, <laughs> Reese, you were money. talking about picking one up a few years down the road. So, um, we'll see what the depreciation ends up being. But, hey. Hey, these always fall off. They uh, do. So. I mean, and frankly, I don't know if this car is truly worth $93,000. I mean, the M5 at 102 is probably not worth that. But, I mean, that's what that costs these days. And for all that crazy horsepower you get, I mean, frankly, that's probably how they justify that lofty price tag. But, but yeah, so let's move on to close out the drive section here with uh, the Volvo V90 Cross Country T6 all-wheel drive. I just got out of this this morning, kind of felt moved to talk about it. It's, uh, it's a lovely car. Ours came in at just over uh, $62,000. It uh, it had the two liter super and turbocharged. That's like a thing Volvo does engine. We're talking 316 horsepower, 295 pound feet of torque. Um, The big thing about this car is how it looks. I think it's got that like wagon like vibe, which it is because it's based on the V90. Um, The inside I think is very pleasing. This one had brown, uh, a lot of brown leather. The seats were really comfortable. It had some really nice like door inserts. I couldn't quite tell you what the materials were, but it was, you know, Volvo. They always have good materials. The steering was light, but still pretty responsive. And it was just fun to drive. It was just the right amount of horsepower. It was gray with kind of like grayish wheels. It looked really cool because you don't see too many like Volvo wagons around here. Um, But the way I kind of left it was, and I'd like to hear what you guys think. The V90 in cross-country trim is not what I would do for the V90. For the V90, regular V90, because I think it's such a beautiful station wagon. Like, don't crap it up with all this, like, cladding and, like, trying to make it like a diet crossover. I get that some people are going to want that. I haven't looked at the sales breakout, but, you know, in this crossover day and age, I would guess more people might even want the cross-country than the regular V90. But for me, it's just like... I don't know, keep it lower to the ground. The lines are just pure with that, you know, really like long wagon feel. That's how I would take my V90. And then when it comes to cross country, give me the V60 in cross country. Uh, Just because I feel like that is a little bit more of a crossover size, the way the proportions are. And that's where I would go with the cross country. What do you guys think? Well, I, I uh, I would go with the regular V90 wagon also, but... I think that's more of a personal thing. I, and I really don't have any issue with the V90 cross country. I, I think it looks pretty nice. Um, and it looks kind of unique if you get it in the luxury package, I think, that gives you body color fender flares instead of the uh, plastic contrasting ones. And I mean, I think I would go with a V90 cross country over an XC90. Interesting. Um, that's not a practical decision because the XC90 has an available third row seat, but I like the interior on the V90 a lot better than the XC90. <laughs> I think you're really starting to like split the hairs here too a little yes, bit. Yes, I am. I started to like... Because they're all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all <laughs> That's good. That's the problem. It, it, you raised an excellent point too that this one looks sweet with like, you know, the cladding blends in with the color and the wheels 
and it's not like that kind of awkward look. Like a couple years ago, we had an all road, an Audi all road that was green with like brown or black cladding. Yes, that's like I liked that combination. So I didn't like that. I was like, oh. what are they doing to this A4? So <laughs> to me, it's like it could kind of it depends on the feel. But um, I really did like this car though. Uh, but you know, the, the different ways you can slice up the cross country versus like the regular body style, if you will. And you're only talking about like like cladding and then like a slightly different ride height. Mm -hmm. um, you know. You're also dealing with availability because unless it's changed recently and I missed it, uh, Volvo is stocking V90 cross countries like on dealer lots. But if you want the regular V90 wagon, you have to special order it. That's interesting. I think um, that makes sense given where the market's going, but I don't know. I mean, I remember when they rolled out, you know, like the 90 series as concepts a few years ago, people were just so in love with like the aesthetics, the design, and that's like what gets people into the Volvo brand. So I'd hate to see them like totally make these like niche vehicles, even though the market is probably telling them that's what they are. Yeah, I... I, I kind of agree with you, Greg. Like, I think I would take the V90 wagon, even if it is like special order only, because I think if I'm spending that much money on a car, I'd probably special order it anyway. And you get to do European delivery with Volvo, which is... That would be fun. Yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. really great. Um, but I do like, if I was just getting the regular V60, I think I would pick the cross country. Um, I don't know. I, it's purely an aesthetic thing. I kind of like the jacked up look of the smaller car and I like the low sleek design of the bigger car. Um, and this one, we got the right powertrain, the T6, not the T8. I like the idea of plug-in hybrids, but Volvo's is not very good. It's also very complex too. There's a yeah. lot going on with the T8. Uh, so what, what is it that you don't like about the T8? The brakes. The okay, brakes that's, are I, awful. That's where I'm at Really, too. really, really <laughs> awful. And I don't like the transmission on that powertrain either because it's like there's so much different things going on that it, the, the gearbox doesn't seem to know how to sort it out. Yeah, because I drove an S60 Polestar engineered and that that's T8 only, I mean, because it's got the most power. But the braking issue is exacerbated because the Polestar engineered gets big, beefy brakes. And so... It's like this really soft, hard to feel thing. And then all of a sudden you get this super strong grab from like the performance brakes and it's, it's rough. <laughs> I've also never been in one of the T8 cars where the ride was very great. Um, a lot of it mm. is the big wheels on pretty much every Volvo. Um, but I think the battery pack adds a lot of weight and it like really kills like the ride. Um, I can't say the same for T6. I think the T6s are fine. Um, I still always try to go the smallest wheels I could in a Volvo. Um, the big ones look really good, but they really kill the ride quality. Um, I just, like I said, I like the idea of a plug-in hybrid, especially with like a nice luxury vehicle like this, but it's just not a good, it's just not a good powertrain. Um, if you're looking at these, save some money, get the T6, um, unless you really, really like, unless like the minimal amount of like electric range really works for your commute. I don't know. I think you're worth better off just saving money and getting the T6. The T6 is kind of a sweet spot. I will say though, I like the T5 more than I thought I would like every time I've driven one. And I don't feel like I'm missing that much between the T5 and the T6, but you do get a decent boost in fuel economy and you're paying a lot less. So, I would almost be tempted to get a T5 over a T6. You guys are just but slowly dropping down the Volvo powertrain. Everybody should here. buy a base front wheel drive spec <laughs> Volvo. Right. But I do mean it. Like I, I've driven the T5s and I'm like, you know, this is actually pretty good. And I don't feel like I'm missing out on much. And like for the better fuel economy and less money up front, eh, it's not bad. But all around, like the T6 is probably the sweet spot. Like unless you're either feeling budget conscious or the hybrid works in your lifestyle in some way. Most people probably should get T6. Agreed. So why don't we move along to the Mercedes GLS? You spent some time in the, the uh, GLS recently. Uh, tell us about this. Yeah, unfortunately, it was not in the seat I would like to be in. Uh, Mercedes is doing some just ride-alongs out in uh, some big sand dunes outside of Las Vegas. Uh, it was cool, though. Like, 
we saw the car like debut like two weeks ago and I got to drive in it like a week and a half later. I don't think I've ever been a turnaround like uh, on a debut to drive like being in a car uh, on the street or uh, this quickly. But uh, yeah, so the GLS, just to give a brief like uh, introduction to it, it's basically a long wheelbase GLE. Uh, which we saw last year, and I think is, I saw one behind me yesterday in traffic. So I assume it's on sale, unless it was another like journalist running around in the area, which is not unheard it's of. Entirely possible. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's uh, big, comfortable uh, SUV. Uh, the basic mantra was to create the S class of SUVs, and in that aspect, they tried to make it like comfortable and capable and roomy. It's got a lot more wheelbase, so the back seat's bigger. Um, it's quieter than ever before. I mean, it's they just up the refinement um, without try- losing any of the like off road capabilities, and that's really what like we were kind of out in the desert to see is like how the new like suspension and all wheel drive systems uh, really improved it. And like they fully admitted, nobody's actually going to be doing this, but part of the appeal, like with Range Rovers is knowing you can. And I think that's kind of what they were going for is like, it's the same with the G class. Like nobody really takes those things off road, but part of why people buy them is like, because they offer it. And if they didn't, the car would pro- wouldn't be as cool. It's, it, a, it's a weird balance there. When you yeah. look at some of these like monster off road vehicles and you're like, you know, that guy never takes it off road. Like, you know, I can't believe how many Rubicons we see rolling around town. And it's like, you know, that thing never sees any mud, but people buy it for the looks. And there is that sort of like, it's almost like cognitive dissonance. You know, you like, you kind of like want it, but you know, you don't need it. But I don't know. Listen, sometimes there are big parking space blocks that you need to climb up and over because... For some reason, you can't get out any other way, and I mean, you can't get over that in a normal car. That's that why seems you need like the Rubicon. You would do in a Mercedes GLS, <laughs> right? Uh, I fully admit to like when I have these SUVs, <laughs> I will do that exact thing. <laughs> yeah, power wagons are pretty bad. Um, power wagon, you could drive over this building yeah. in, but like it, I've yeah. done it in Range Rovers. I've done it in like probably other Mercedes. Like if it's got a- adjustable air suspension, I know it's going to clear it. I try it just to do it. But going back to the GLS. Um, from all indications, this thing seems really good. Uh, I really would like to drive it. I wish I could have, but they were still doing some final tuning, so they didn't want to let us get behind the wheel. Um, the two things I really want to talk about are briefly the new V8. Uh, it's getting a 4-liter V8 to replace the old 4.7-liter V8. Still twin turbo, um, but it's got a 48-volt system, just like the new inline 6. Uh, so you get all the improvements you get like, uh, the low end torque with the, uh, because it spins up the, uh, compressor, you get the improved fuel economy. I mean, it's, it's makes more power and gets, I think 20, 20% better fuel economy than the old V8. So like, that's impressive. Yeah. You're not losing anything. Um, and that 48 volt system powers this, uh, rad suspension. So it's basically a, a air suspension in all four corners. But what the car does is it uses the camera for the like radar cruise control and the uh, active safety stuff to scan the road in front of you and pre-charge or like the firmness or the softness of the suspension based on what it reads. So it, I think it can do like 400 feet out. So if it sees pot, a pothole, it will like soften the suspension to like allow wheels to dip um so the body stays relatively flat now mercedes is really good with tech they've always been a tech forward company so i expected this to work really great on on pavement like where it's kind of a known quantity all you're really looking for is maybe some undulations and uh the occasional pothole they really wanted to show how great this thing works off-road uh so we were uh running around on these dirt roads near these dunes And it was great. We got to go back and forth between two models, one that had the suspension on and one that had it off. And it was a night and day difference. I've never, like, any, like, time I've ever been in a car from 
growing up, never been in a car that was as comfortable off road as this thing was. I That's mean, it, interesting. It was uh, kind of like transcendental. Like it's, I mean, it really kind of changes the way like an off road vehicle can ride for like a luxury vehicle like this. It's never going to be as capable of as, as a Wrangler. I mean, it's just not. It's but it's not made to be that hardcore. Um, I've never heard someone say comfortable and off road together. Yeah, I've never I, found off road to be all that comfy. And I, I, it may sound like I'm, I'm kind of spinning on hyperbole, but like it really is amazing. Um, it's it's phenomenal, and it like makes me really want to drive the car. Like in my like when I can get behind the wheel, like the suspension's so good. I mean, it's go, I, I'll have a story up on the site. Uh, by the time this podcast goes live, check out the video, um, that's in there because it really kind of shows what the, uh, GLS can do. Um, it's, it's really kind of amazing. And briefly, I want to talk about the all wheel drive system because that was kind of the most fun part. Uh, the old GLS was like a fixed 50, 50 front to rear torque distribution. Um, which is great for always getting traction, but uh, it wasn't great for driving dynamics. So the new all-wheel drive system, like uh, AMGs, uh, can send 100% of the power to the rear most of the time and up to 50% to the front when uh, you need traction. What that means is you can kind of dial in oversteer and understeer on demand. Uh, what we actually got to do was like drift around the sand dunes. I mean, it was like, like lift off like, turn in and like get the ass end out. Like it was, it was a lot of fun. So and that's not something I thought you would have been doing on the GLS right. uh, experience. I didn't think I'd be doing it when I like went out there for this drive, but like it's seriously look at, go to the site, look at the photos, look at, watch the video. Like it, uh, you can see exactly what I'm talking about with all this. Um, I, I'm excited for this. Uh, I like big SUVs anyway. I drove the X BMW X seven, a few uh, weeks ago, maybe a month now or whatever. Um, I like that. And my initial impressions from the passenger seat, at least on the, uh, GLS is it's a little bit better. All right. Well, we'll, we'll leave it there. That's uh that's going to be a really interesting, maybe comparison we do down the road. Um, people like to know how these expensive SUVs rate and we'll figure that out. Uh, and be sure to check out Reese's story. And of course, uh, a couple other things we have reported on is that list of cars that uh, needed refreshes quickly. You got to check out that list. It's pretty cool. There's cars on there I totally forgot about. Um, also, so let's move along to uh, kind of a quick hit section here on AMG. How many AMGs is too many? Now, this sprung from a conversation Reese and I were having over the um, cubicle walls. And I forget even what like brought this up, but... We both got into it. So I drove the uh, Mercedes came out with the new inline six. I guess they announced it a few years ago and excuse me, they've slowly been rolling it out um, across different model lines. A few, maybe a month and a half ago, I got to fly to Napa and drive all the E53 variants, which is the um, high output version of this new uh, turbocharged inline six. Uh, and check out my story on the site for like more on that. Uh, what we're going to talk about, like, and what they mentioned in the uh, little like backgrounder, is there are 47 different AMG variants in the U.S. Now that's individually counting like E class coupe, sedan, and cabriolet. So that's three model lines there, and then you kind of extract like go out through like the GLE coupe versus like standard one, and then you've got two. So. <sighs> It 47 is a little like that's pretty much, inflated, but still, but 47. Um, and I'm personally a little torn in this. Um, on the one hand, everyone I've driven is usually really pretty good. Um, the engines are great, I think they drive well. I think they're kind of like putting BMW in their place, uh, w when it comes to like steering and driving dynam dynamics, which is was not the case for years. Um, and all the engines are really great. On the other hand, like part of what made AMGs so special, like back in the day, is like they were a little exclusive. They were a little low volume, and they were like when you saw one, it was kind of special. And now, like, it, and this is like a customer thing. Like with the G Class, the AMGs in the U.S. outsell the regular one, and it's I don't know. I, I 
they all drive really great, but like, I feel like they're losing a bit of their like specialness. And where it kind of like where I start to feel some of the like, I don't know, confusion, irritation is that there's like tiers of AMG now. Yes. It used to be like, it was a special limited thing and it had the big engine and it would rip your head off and it was a special car. Now it's like, well, you could get an inline six or you could get bigger engines. And it's like, then there's AMG like, you know, appearance things. And it's like, to me, that's where you really do start to water down your brand, I think. Yeah, it was, AMGs were always like the most powerful, the most exclusive versions of whatever model line they were in. Like I own a C43 and it was the fastest C class you could get back in the day. Same goes for the E55 or uh, the Hammer or back in like the 80s. Like they were exclusive and there was like no equal when it comes to power. Um, and now, like you said, they're kind of tiered and you, like you look at the E53 and you're like, oh, that's really good. I love that car, but they make the E63. So it's, it's no longer like, I don't know. They've just muddied the waters. To me, AMG used to, at least in recent memory, mean 6.3 on yeah. the front quarter panels. And that was important. It was special. <laughs> it was really 6.2, but whatever. That was like a V8 that was just iconic, you know? And to me, it's like. I guess where I start to feel, like I said, a little little bit not sure, is like, do they need to call the inline six, no matter how powerful and how good it is, did that need to actually be called an AMG? Because they've called it something else. It's less lucrative. You know, I'm sure they could charge more money by saying, well, hey, we have this AMG for you. But I don't know. That to me is like, once you start to like really slice up one of your like really iconic sacred cows, whatever cliche you want to use, that's where I start to get a little nervous. Yeah, you don't get the hand built engine like you do in the like the like in a Falterbach. Yes, like the top tier models, all the sixty threes, like get these hand built like engines, and like the lower spec ones don't. They're built along the same production line as the rest of them, and it, I don't know, it, it loses a little bit. They drive great, but like I don't know, you miss something there, Joel. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely get I get what you're saying and I don't know. I guess I guess maybe I've just gotten so cynical about any kind of German performance anything just the it kind of feels like every single one of those companies is just willing to crank out every single little niche product possible and clearly it's working. Otherwise they wouldn't be doing it because like they must be selling these things hand over fist to just right. keep cranking them out. So I don't know. I, I guess I, I don't know. I guess maybe I just feel kind of like I don't even care anymore. It's like, you just do whatever you want. German automakers. Cause That's clearly you don't care point. either. <laughs> I guess if they're not worried about diluting their brand, why are we? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, they're all selling really well. And they're and good they, cars. They, yes. They're all good cars. Um, it's a perception thing, but if customers don't seem to mind, then it really, what does it matter? I mean, it's just kind of us talking in a room, but and I mean, like, I guess I think it's, it's just worn me down a lot of it. Cause even like just in badging, I mean, you were talking about AMG 63 kind of meant something cause it was an allusion to the displacement, even if it was off by like a 10th of a liter now, I mean, AMG 53, it's a three liter straight six, like, yeah. The number isn't even remotely close to whatever's under the hood anymore. So I think I've just kind of like, I just don't even, I, I think I don't even care anymore. <laughs> like it's been so screwed up. <laughs> so I think we've got yes, yes, and don't care, which is a pretty good, uh, which is probably how a lot of people feel actually. All right. So we'll leave AMG there and move on to spend my money. We've got an interesting one. This one comes from the R Cars Mega Thread, uh, where they, uh, basically uh, put car questions about what should they buy. Uh, this one comes from a writer from Massachusetts. The price range is five to $10,000. Uh, they want to buy the car, looking for a used car with some tuning potential. Manual transmission, relatively easy to tune uh, with some decent aftermarket parts options. Uh, this would be a daily driver. And here is what they've considered. Quite a few of them here. This is the 1992 Pulsar I was referencing earlier in the uh, in the podcast. Uh, GTIR, uh, let's see, a couple of different Golf GTIs. Uh, we've got a WRX and Evo 2. 
Miata briefly. I'm a big guy, so it doesn't sound like he's really considering the Miata. E63 BMW, R32 Skyline, uh, CRX, and a ton of others. Really indecisive. Wow, I'm out of breath reading that list. Uh, And there were a few others I think I actually left out. So is this your first car? Technically, it's the fourth, but actually the third. I don't even know what that means, but I wanted to read it out loud. Doesn't need a warranty. Uh, Dude could do some minor work on the car and major work. Uh, Yeah, so the car could basically be pretty much anything. So uh, that's a lot. Any initial impressions here, guys? I love this question, by the way, too. Any question that's all over the place means we could actually sort of like unpack it and try and, you know, give a real answer. Joel, this question is almost a little bit of a nightmare for me just because it's like, it's, it's so open-ended. It's like, I don't like, part Four of me is like, an just, engine, please. I know. It's just like, part of me is like, well, whatever you're feeling on the day that you have the money to go buy something, go buy that. <laughs> like, but because it. Other people at least have like requirements like, oh, it's got to, it has to seat this many people or it has to have a hatchback or it has to have like four wheel drive. This is, I mean, we're looking at Miatas, Evos and GTIs, like all, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I, I think he's going to have a little trouble, uh, getting some, one of these for like under $10,000, uh, like Pulsar GTI R, like those are rare. They're I think they're hovering around like 12 or 15. Um, but like, I mean, anything on this list is interesting, especially if like, it's not your first car. If this thing breaks and you have to sideline it, if you've got something else, buy something interesting, buy something fun. Um, to that note, I would uh, shy away from the GTI. I know like I espouse its ver- uh, virtues all the time on this podcast. And if you're looking at one, get the Mark V. You can get them under 10,000. But if, like, it's not your first car, get something, like, I would go with, like, maybe the Sylvia or the Skyline um, or the Pulsar. I mean, if you can find one, that's a really, really rad car. Um, Yeah, I mean, like, any of these. Get a JDM thing. Just import something, go to Top Rank or whatever, and find something interesting. Don't buy something you can get in the U.S. If it's not your first car, if you can't afford the import stuff, import something or find something that's been imported. That's my take. Any anything on this list is good. So what I think is funny is you've made like he's kind of indecisive, and then you're like, well, here, let's take the most complicated route to getting this car, import yeah. it. Um, it. Joel, yeah, I, I think you're kind of you're spot on too with the way this <laughs> lands. I my answer is actually pretty simple. I would go with an E36. Pick the one you like, find a price, and go for it. Because it sounds like um, uh, the guy's a little bit bigger. There's some room in those cars. Yeah, they're going to be, I mean, you might be driving a junker in a few years, but if, you know, it's a fun car, you know, maybe you find with some low miles, make friends with your local Bimmer dealer, and you could probably get three, four years out of it. It would be pretty fun, so. Yeah, now that I'm, so, now that I've had a little bit of time to think about this, um, I will say, yeah, the E36 is probably a pretty solid idea, especially, like, if it's not your only car, you can risk something that might not be super reliable. Uh, I think I can probably rule out Skyline WRX and JDM Evos might be a little tricky to get under $10,000 imported. Um, but an S13, like 240SX, that could be a pretty good choice too because that would be a decent amount of room. It's rear drive, huge aftermarket support, yeah. whether you want to do a modified KA engine that's already in it, or if you want to swap in an SR20 from a Japanese market one, or if you want to be really weird, go with a CA18 from the 180SX from Japan, or any or even LS swap it, which would be... That's a bold a, move. But yeah, I mean, it would be a solid choice. I mean, you'd have lots of power, lots of aftermarket, and a really light chassis. Um If you want something a little more comfortable, I'm scanning through some of the Japanese import sites I know. Um, Nissan Cedrics and Glorias are hovering around like $9,000. And those are kind of, I mean, they're big sedans, but there's a lot of aftermarket support because they share so much with like other uh, Nissan performance cars. Um, Yeah, just get something interesting. Uh, Like 
don't I like I said, I would shy away from something you can get in the US. If 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 you can wait, if it's not your first car, do something cool. I'll also throw out, I mean, any kind of like nineties to two thousands Honda could be really good too, an Integra, Civic SI. Those all have monster aftermarket support and you can make a shocking amount of power out of one of those if you really put the time and effort into it. And you can get them for really cheap right off the bat. Yeah. A range of choices there. One that just literally popped into my head is a 90s Impala. Uh, I believe those prices are probably a bit more than uh, the price range here. But, um, I mean, you could work on that car. It's a bigger car. And, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like this guy's, you know, skewing for like an American car. But, I mean, hey, it's, you know, it seems like you're in that kind of era of of cars. Check that out. See what the prices are. See... You know, it's it's fun to drive a Corvette engine from the 90s in a really big, comfy car. So that's just a random thought. I would still say E36, though. Yeah, maybe even, I mean, you could maybe even get like, you could get a Caprice for dirt, dirt cheap and then swap that and have close to an Impala SS. Um, I think my only note on those is they didn't come with manuals from the factory. No. Um, but if you find a manual swap Impala, I've seen them out there. Those are really cool. Um, and we were discussing a little bit also earlier, Fox bodies are always a strong option too. Yeah. I, does any car have the aftermarket support of a Mustang? Maybe the Wrangler? <laughs> like, Yeah. For, <laughs> Wrangler might be about the only real com- comparable vehicle there. All right. So we're a little all over the place with this one, but I hope we... Uh... We hope you help. We hope we helped you out with uh, some choices, at least narrowing it down, giving you some new options, and uh, we'll have to leave it there, guys. It's been a fun show. It's been a long one, but a good one. Uh, thanks for listening. Be safe out there. We'll see you next week.